Good afternoon, everyone, especially for those of you I see, actually just one of you who traveled with us on this most recent trip, uh, Humera. Hope you got some rest over the weekend. I don't see anyone else. Matt's not here. Um, hope you got some rest over the weekend. Uh, and I uh, look, it looks like your colleagues who were on that trip did not show up today. So um, anyway, I don't have any opening statements. So um, Humera, you want to start us? Yeah, sure. Um, so on, on Rafa, uh, Matt, uh, Israeli delegation is not coming here. Um, how will the U.S. be able to present its alternative uh, proposals to Israel since they're not going to be here this week? Uh, so I saw the statement from the government of Israel. I would say uh, it was a bit surprising and unfortunate. Uh, the U.N. Security Council resolution that passed today uh, from which the United States abstained. Uh, there were issues where that we had concern, uh, issues with which we had concerns related to that resolution, the fact that it did not condemn Hamas's terrorist attacks of October 7th. That's why we didn't uh, vote for it. But the reason we didn't veto it is because there were also things in that uh, resolution that were consistent with our long-term uh, position. Most importantly, that there should be a ceasefire and that there should be a release of hostages, which is what we understood also to be the government of Israel's position. So uh, it is a bit surprising and unfortunate that they're not going to apparently attend these meetings um, because, as you heard the secretary say in Tel Aviv on Friday after he met with Prime Minister Netanyahu and other members of the Israeli government, <clears throat> we believe that, number one, a full-scale invasion of Rafah would be a mistake. It would be a mistake not just because of the civilian harm that it would cause, which would be immense. There are somewhere around 1.4 million uh, people in Rafah now, and the government of Israel has not presented a credible plan to uh, evacuate those people to other areas and take care of them once they were moved. Um, but also, and this was, I think, an important thing that the Secretary said, we also think that this type of invasion would weaken Israel's security. It would make Israel uh, less safe, not more safe. It would undermine its standing in the world. Uh, so we are ready to present to them uh, plans that we believe would achieve their legitimate goal, which is the defeat of Hamas, but would do so in a way that does not cause uh, undue civilian harm and does not weaken Israel's overall security. So we will uh, look forward to continuing to have those discussions with them. But I mean, do you have a plan right now, like when that would happen? Would that be over the phone? Would Secretary Lincoln go? Would you try to, and also, has there been any communication with the Israeli government at high level following this decision? So um, a few things in order. So first of all, we started these discussions with them last week in Tel Aviv. As you know, the secretary discussed uh, the potential invasion of Rafah with Prime Minister Netanyahu and the War Cabinet in Tel Aviv and laid out our very serious concerns. Uh, Defense Minister Gallant is here today. He'll be meeting with the secretary in a little over two hours, and I would expect that will be the subject of conversations in that meeting. And I understand he has uh, a meeting with other officials in the, the, uh, the government uh, over the, the course of today and tomorrow. So we will have those discussions there. And then I'm, I uh, am sure we will find other ways to um, make our concerns known to the government of Israel at very senior levels, but I don't have anything to announce uh, with respect to that uh, today. And then with respect to your final question, so we have had ongoing communications with officials from the Israeli government about this UN Security Council resolution going back multiple days, going back to last week. And we had talked about uh, different versions. As you may recall, there was a, a, a different draft that was put forward first um, that uh, called for a permanent ceasefire, which is not something that we supported. Um, uh, we want, as you know, want to see an immediate ceasefire, but linked to hostages. And then we want to build that into something more enduring. So we had been in close contact with them about this resolution. And as I said, we believe this resolution is consistent with our policy on this matter, and consistent with what we believe to be the government of Israel's policy. So um, we have had conversations with them over the last 24 hours, and I'm sure those will continue. Yeah, just just um, one, a couple of other things. Um, just to be sure, so will Secretary discuss with uh, Defense Minister Gallant the alternatives that United States was going to no. That will not be the main. I, I am sure that it will come up to some extent, but we do not have a presentation, a detailed presentation along those lines planned for this meeting today. Okay. And I hope you don't call this a hypothetical. This is now very much a high possibility that everybody has the sense that whatever happens, you, you know, regardless of you presenting alternative options or not, Israel will just go ahead with this offensive the way it sees it appropriate. They have said this publicly. 
actually Prime Minister Netanyahu said it on the day that Secretary Blinken, we were there on Friday, we will go alone if need be. So what is the, is the United States going to try to stop it if that would be the case? So I, I think I would answer that by saying we will make clear to them what the Secretary made clear on Friday, which is that we believe this type of full-scale invasion would be a mistake. It would be a mistake not just because of the extraordinary impact it would have on the somewhere around 1.4 million civilians who are in Rafa now, but it would also be a mistake because it would harm Israel's overall security. Um, we think there is a better way to do it that would accomplish, as I said, what is a very legitimate national security goal of Israel's, which is to uh, defeat the Hamas battalions that remain in Rafah. So we will continue to make that case to them. Uh, I expect that uh, we will have other ways to do so over the coming days, but I would not want to make any predictions about um, what will come after that. So, Matt. Last week when you guys presented your resolution at the UN, um, there were complaints from people who said that uh, it, it de-linked the ceasefire from the release of hostages. And U.S. officials were rather vociferous in saying that that is not, not the case. However, what you guys abstained on today does appear to de-link them. Is that your understanding? Of, so of, we of, don't believe it de-links them. You see in the same paragraph it called the resolution calling for both a ceasefire and the release of hostages. It's not the exact language that we would have put forward, obviously, because the language that we would put forward is the language that we did put forward last week, but it is language that is consistent with our policy to call for both a ceasefire and the release of hostages, and that's why uh, we did not exercise a veto today. As I said, we did have concerns about the lack of other provisions in the, the resolution, but as it pertains to a ceasefire and the release of hostages, both the things that we called for were there in the resolution. The other provisions you're referring to, is, is there something more than just a condemnation of Hamas? That is, the, the, that is our... Um, or were, uh, were they plural? That, that is our, our chief objection. Uh, I'll refer to the the Okay, uh, but the abstention means that for, you're, you're okay with it. You're willing to go along with it. And, uh, and so what do you expect now to happen as a result of the passage of this resolution? So I think... Do you expect that Israel is going to announce a ceasefire? I do not. It's, and that, so, do you expect that Hamas is going to I, release yeah. hostages? So I'm, gl I'm, I'm glad you, get, uh, you mentioned that, because one of the things that we have objected to for some time is that most of the people that call for a ceasefire, we believe, are calling for Israel to unilaterally stop operations and not calling for Hamas to agree to a ceasefire where they would release hostages. Well, I so, think it goes both so, ways, so, doesn't it? It could. But so the... the so, but, oh, wait, 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 wait. wait, no, wait. No, no, no. The, but the right. resolution today is not is a non-binding resolution. But okay, we do so what's think, the point? W well, why 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 did you, you why did you e abstain? Why didn't you veto? Um, we didn't veto because we thought the language in it was consistent um, with something that uh, the language as it relates to the ceasefire and release of hostage was consistent with the long-standing so, United States position. So you don't believe anything is going to happen as a result of the passage of this resolution? So I think that separate and apart from this resolution, we have active, ongoing negotiations to try to achieve what this resolution calls for, mm -hmm. which is the um, uh, an immediate ceasefire and the release of hostages. I don't know. I can't say that this impact this resolution is going to have any impact on those negotiations. So, but those negotiations are ongoing. They've been ongoing over the weekend, and they've made progress. Uh, so I, I don't expect you to answer this now. But do you just stick this in your pocket? If that's the case, what the hell is the point of the UN? Or the UN Security Council. So we think it plays an important role. Um, um, it it does, range even though of, its action does absolutely nothing. A range and of every and, and that you're going to get what you would like to see, not out of the UN, but out of discussions in Doha. So we believe it's important that the UN speak uh, and the UN Security Council speak on matters of uh, uh, international security. It's why we've been engaged in this process. It's why we thought. We were going to have a successful vote on Friday that Russia and China uh, unfortunately and quite cynically vetoed. But I do believe that ultimately if we were able to achieve a ceasefire and the release of hostages, it is going to come not through a UN process but th through the process with which we've been engaged, yes, in Doha. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just to put it in other words, I mean, do you expect it, not just Israel but Hamas, do you expect compliance with this resolution? You mentioned it's non-binding. Is it your expectation that, that Israel would actually, and, and Hamas for that matter, would actually say, okay, look, here's a ceasefire in the month of Ramadan? So I don't think you're going to see Hamas uh, complying with any uh, United Nations Security Council resolution. But, but do you and, want them to? But I would say, as I said, it's a non-binding resolution, but 
we do believe that um, the ceasefire and release of hostages that the resolution calls for is not only the United States position, but has been Israel's position. This is what Israel has been trying to achieve through, through these negotiations. So uh, I would hope that we could get to that uh, agreement through these negotiations, and I would hope we get that in the near future. Let me just put it one, one more way. I mean, if, if the fighting continues I mean, on both sides, is that Again, saying it's non-binding, but is that a violation of, of, of the Security Council? Uh, again, it's a non-binding resolution, and I would defer to uh, international lawyers to speak in detail to that question. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, on, uh, I don't know what you've said yesterday that Israel told him that they will no longer ex uh, allow honor uh, convoys to enter northern Gaza. I mean, if we add to this uh, that there are so many uh, incidents where Israeli fired on people queuing, for uh, aid in northern Gaza, do you uh, do you still believe, or do, is it still the U.S. assessment that uh, Israel is not using food or uh, uh, assistance as a tool of war? So we have not made an assessment or drawn the conclusion that they are in violation of international humanitarian law when it comes to the provision of humanitarian assistance into Gaza. That said. We do believe there is very much more that they can do to let humanitarian assistance go in, <coughs> both through Karim Shalom and Rafa, and also through the new 96 gate that opened up a uh, week before last to allow convoys to move directly into the north uh, without having to transit the somewhat perilous route inside Gaza. So we do believe that there is, is more that they can do, uh, probably more that they can do. And it, I should say it's, it's not just with respect to UNRWA, but with respect to other UN agencies um, that are operating and providing humanitarian assistance uh, to Palestinians in Gaza today. Uh, uh, the budget deal that was uh, passed in the Congress also prevent you, prevent the United States government from funding UNRWA. And we've been, we've been asked about this here in this, uh, asking you on this podium before, and you said that you, wanted to, you don't want to talk about something that didn't happen, but now it seems that it's happening. What is your plan to give aid to Gaza now that you cannot deal with honor. So first of all, I should make very clear that we're going to comply with the law. And you've heard me speak about the fact that we had to prepare for the possibility that this might become law because it's something that you've seen members of Congress propose and you've seen it uh, in a bill that had previously passed the, the United States Senate. So we have been working to identify alternatives to provide humanitarian assistance uh, uh, to UNRWA. Um, UNRWA will continue its work. There are other countries that are funding UNRWA. There are other countries that have lifted their pauses on funding of UNRWA over the past few weeks, and we expect that their important work uh, will go forward. As for the United States, we still will provide humanitarian assistance to the Palestinian people. That is our commitment. It's something that we have done for decades, and it's something that we have we will continue to do. Uh, and so we have had a process ongoing to identify how we can best deliver that funding uh, and, and that assistance outside of UNRWA if Congress did take the step that it has now taken. Uh, and I expect you'll see us um, uh, move along in that process over the, the coming weeks and months. But UNRWA is not now the only humanitarian provider that's operating in Gaza. We've seen, for example, the World Food Program uh, that, has, uh, that has run some of these convoys that have moved up inside Israel and crossed into northern Gaza through the 96 gate. So we'll look to work with WFP and other programs, UNICEF perhaps, uh, on ways to get the humanitarian assistance that we can provide, that we can fund, into the people who need it. One last question, yeah. Matt. Uh, 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 I want, I, I'm seeking if you have any comment about the video that Al Jazeera uh, broadcast on Friday about uh, uh, Israeli drone attacking Palestinian five five uh, men with uh, drone missiles. I don't know if you see the video or not, but clearly in the video, at least from the way that we see it, they were unarmed, they look civilians, and they were targeted numerous times by rockets from a drone. So I've seen the video, I'm not able to offer an assessment uh, as to the identi identity of the individuals uh, in the video or any of the circumstances surround it, surrounding it, uh, but it is something that we've asked the Israelis for more information about. Saeed. Thank you. A couple of follow-ups. Now, you were saying, I think in response to Omaira, uh, on, you know, you will share with the Israelis <coughs> ways to target Hamas without having a full invasion. Is that what you said, sir? Yes, we made that yeah, okay. clear for some All time. Right. You made that very clear. Does that mean that the United States will actually go into combat against Hamas? No, that is uh, not at all what that means. What does that mean? 
it means that we will provide advice to Israel right. about ways that, that they can uh, accomplish their legitimate objective, right. which is to defeat the remaining Hamas right. battalions that are, are operating in Rafah, right. but without a full-scale invasion that would right. lead to mass humanitarian suffering. But we have been very clear that there will be no uh, U.S. combat troops on the ground. And that would be also, a, you know, in the sharing of intelligence and things of that I'm, nature. Those you are know, conversations we're going to have privately. Hold on. Hold, with the government of Israel, I'm certainly not going to read them out here. All right. I have a couple of questions uh, to you on, on the resolution. Now, uh, does this resolution have any practical future? What do you mean? Does it have any practical? I mean, does it have, I mean, it's a non-binding resolution, right? So does it have, you know, could it be like a, a step forward toward a bigger, you know, binding resolution? How, is that how you see So it? I'm not going to speculate about what steps the, the United Nations Security Council uh, are going to take ne next, but we have been clear about what we are trying to achieve with respect to the conflict in Gaza, and that is to achieve uh, an immediate sustainable ceasefire linked to the release of hostages that we can then build into something more enduring. That has been something we've been pursuing for some time. It's something that we have pursued in uh, negotiations in Doha over the weekend. And as I said, we believe that we've made progress in that, including progress in, in, uh, over the weekend, and we'll continue to pursue it. Okay. Now, a couple more things on, uh, on, on UNRWA, you know, uh, respond to Ahmed's questions and so on uh, on UNRWA. Now, Israel, with the new law that, you know, defunding uh, UNRWA has become law, they can say we don't want any UNRWA operations anywhere in Gaza or the West Bank that are really totally dependent on the UNRWA operation. You know, I know you mentioned the World Food Program and so on, but it does not have the kind of mechanism and logistics in place and the history behind it that UNRWA has. So do you expect that the Israelis will just Throw out under a lock, stock, and barrel. I am not going to make any predictions about uh, what the government of Israel, what steps the government of Israel might take. I will make clear, uh, as we have, that we continue to support the important work that UNRWA does to provide humanitarian assistance to the Palestinian people. Right. Uh, and lastly, I, I don't know if you're f f following up on the West Bank. The Israelis uh, confiscate or order issue to confiscate. 3,000 dollars. It's the largest in many decades and so on. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, we have been very clear in our position that uh, these settlements are inconsistent with international humanitarian law and that they are ultimately a barrier to peace. International law. International law, excuse me. Yeah, I'm so, so, yeah, I'm so used to talking about humanitarian yeah. law in the context yeah. of the rest of this. Yeah. Yeah. Like international law. About uh, some Israeli general saying that he had been told by a State Department official that there was incontrovertible evidence that Isra IDF troops I, had raped I, I, Palestinian I, women. I did see that report. It is not accurate. Um, what, what, um, what does that mean? My understanding. My, yeah, my understanding of the meeting is that um, uh, you had a State Department official who said in these meetings what we have said consistently publicly, which is that Israel must thoroughly and transparently investigate credible allegations of wrongdoing and assure ensure accountability uh, for any abuses and violations. That's what they, what this official said, which is what we've said publicly. You've heard me say from this podium many times. Nothing more. I take up uh, another aspect of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, the issue of NSM-20. Um, could we discuss that in terms of what, what the communication has been so far with Israel? There's a deadline, of course, over the weekend. Has Israel presented um, uh, assurances, if you want to call it that, and, and what's the U.S. response? Yeah, so um, there was a deadline actually yesterday for us to receive assurances from all seven countries, not just Israel, but all seven countries uh, to whom the United States provides defense articles and are in uh, active con conflict. There's a separate provision of the memo that provides a separate timeline. I think it's six months for countries to whom we provide defense articles but are not in active conflict. But for these seven countries, which are Colombia, Iraq, Israel, Kenya, Nigeria, Somalia, and Ukraine, we have received uh, written assurances uh, that are required um, uh, in the, the memo. Uh, in each case, these assurances were made by a credible high-level official in the partner government uh, who has the ability and authority to make decisions and commitments uh, about the issues at the heart of the assurances. And the next step, uh, as provided in the uh, National Security Memorandum, is that we will be compiling a public uh, compiling a report and issuing it to Congress by May 8th. Okay, so you, you um, so the credible assurances, um, and you say not just Israel, but but all these countries involved. I mean, obviously, the, there's a lot of interest in Israel in light of what's happening in Gaza. Yeah. So it's the understanding of the United States that that what Israel's doing, it's it's credible in terms of their their assurances, but. Uh, U.S. weapons. Yeah. So, so first of all, um, 
I should be clear that these assurances are prospective, but of course our view on them is informed by our ongoing assessments of Israel's conduct uh, in the, the war in Gaza. So we have had ongoing assessments about their compliance with their national humanitarian law. I've spoke to them uh, from this podium before. We have the CHURD process that is examining specific incidents. We have not found them to be in violation of international humanitarian law either when it comes to um, uh, the conduct of the war or when it comes to the provision of humanitarian assistance. So we view their uh, assurances through that ongoing work that we have done. And I should make clear, those ongoing assessments are not something that started because of the National Security Memorandum, and they're not something that stopped because we got these assurances from Israel yesterday. They, they will um, uh, be ongoing um, uh, when we get credible reports uh, or credible allegations of misconduct. Um, we look at them through the process that we have ongoing and ultimately we will make the appropriate conclusions and the, to the extent that um, uh, we are able to do so in the report that's due on May 8th, uh, they will be provided to Congress through that report. Sorry, I just wanted, you said every, all, all seven countries had submitted? All seven, yeah. I mean, uh, you, you yourself have, have discussed the, the civilian casualties, the civilian toll there in, in, in Gaza. So, I mean, is that consistent with it? I mean, so you think that even though there's a civilian toll, that, that the U.S. US uh, that the use of U.S. weapons, that there are credible assurances that have been given there, um, is that not inconsistent at all to, to say that? So they have given us assurances. Um, I would say when it comes to finding a violation of international humanitarian law, um, that requires a fact-intensive analysis of uh, relevant factors related to international humanitarian law. So you've heard me speak to this before. If you're to assess whether a particular strike is in uh, compliance with international humanitarian law, you have to know who was the target of the strike. You have to know what steps they took to minimize um, civilian harm. You have to know to what extent the, they were successful. And so we have ongoing processes to look at those things. Um, and those were uh, processes that started before this memorandum was signed by the president. There were processes that were ongoing before we received these assurances and their processes that will continue to be ongoing. But as of yet, we have not made a conclusion that Israel is in uh, violation of international humanitarian law. Yeah. Um, do you have uh, this, does this uh, um, response from 11 NGOs uh, saying that Israel is in breach of the national security memorandum, does that feed in at all to the U.S. assessment? Is the U.S. <clears throat> listening to NGOs that have had experience or uh, on-ground experience in Gaza? So we welcome uh, uh, reports. We welcome credible uh, information uh, from NGOs um, or anyone else who has credible allegations about potential violations of international humanitarian law. And we would urge uh, NGOs or anyone else to submit them to the United States government, to mit submit them to the State Department. And it's part of what we will look at in our ongoing assessments. A anything else on Gaza before I move yes. on? Yeah. Janny, I know you're not asking about Gaza. <laughs> go, ahead. Go, 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 go ahead, I'll come, I'll come back to you. Following up on the U.S. resolution, you said that it's non-binding, but some others are also arguing that it is binding like other, several other U.N. Security Council mm -hmm. resolutions. Has there been any, you know, is there any ongoing discussion about, about this at the U.N. between the U.S. representatives and others? And, uh, and also, you know, um, the, I remember it was last November, the UN Security Council also adopted a resolution calling for extended and urgent humanitarian pauses and corridors in Gaza, uh, which was binding and which was rejected by Israel, like uh, several other UN Security Council resolutions in the past. So will the US in encourage Israel to comply with UN resolutions and international law? if Israel is not about the law. So with respect to the first re uh, resolution, it is our uh, interpretation of this resolution that it is non-binding. Um, and uh, for any detail on that, I would refer you to the office of our ambassador to the United Nations, who can, of course, speak in more detail of how we reach that conclusion. With respect to the other resolution, of course, we always expect all of our partner nations to comply with their national law. Uh, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, Gaza. Gaza, Gaza. Go ahead, Michelle. What will the discuss this afternoon with the Israeli Defense Minister? So it will be a continuation of the discussions that we had on Friday in Israel when the Secretary met with the Israeli War Cabinet. Um, uh, Defense Minister Gallant was in those meetings where we talked about our concerns about Rafa. We talked about the need to uh, increase the level of humanitarian assistance uh, making into Gaza and make sure that that increase in assistance is sustained. And then I'm sure that uh, the Defense Minister will have other things on his mind and we'll have a readout of the meeting afterwards. 
Uh, in, his, uh, in a video uh, statement that he made in front of the White House, uh, Minister Gallant has said, we have no moral uh, right to stop the war until we return all the abductees to their homes. Uh, stopping the war in Gaza before a clear decision is made endangers Israel's security and may bring us closer to war from the north. So, do you, have, do you have any comments? So I haven't seen his full statement, so I'm always reluctant to respond when I see a, um, uh, or when I have a, a brief quote read out to me of what may be a, a larger statement. But of course, we want to see all the hostages returned home. That has been something we have tried to achieve from the beginning. And of course, it was uh, the negotiations that led to the first pause that, that uh, in which the United States was an active player that secured the release of over 100 hostages. And the United States has been actively engaged, including this weekend, to try to secure the release of every remaining hostage. And we will not let up on that goal. I would add, as you heard me say, that we also, I've said this two or three times already, but when you hear officials from the Israeli government say that they want to see the defeat of the Hamas battalions in Rafah and they will not stop the war before that, we also want to see the defeat of those Hamas battalions in Rafah. We share that same goal, but we think it's a false choice to say that there's not a better way to do it uh, than, than uh, uh, smashing into Rafah in a way that would lead to um, an, uh, an uh, inordinate amount of human suffering. And what about when he said that uh, any uh, ceasefire will endanger uh, Israel's security and may bring us closer as uh, Israelis to war from the north? So I, again, I'm a little reluctant to, to um, respond specifically to that comment because I haven't seen the rest of what he, the defense minister said. But it has been the, uh, the position of the government of Israel to try and reach a ceasefire that would um, secure the release of hostages. That's what they've been pursuing in these hostage negotiations. It's what we've been pursuing. Yes, sir. Shannon, go ahead. I just put a fine point on the resolution. You said a couple times that you were surprised by the Israeli government's reaction uh, to the U.S. abstention, but we do know the U.S. was involved in negotiations basically up to the vote. So is there uh, some kind of disconnect for that surprise to be there? Did Israel not say they were against this kind of resolution? So I'm not going to get into our private conversations with uh, officials from the government of Israel, but we had been in close contact with them about this resolution uh, going back into last week. We obviously were in contact with them about the resolution that the United States uh, put forward that was ultimately vetoed on Friday. And when you kind of come down to brass tacks, the text of the resolution is something that calls for what we believe has been the government of Israel's position, which was uh, a ceasefire and the release of hostages. So that's why we found um, their statement today unfortunate and a bit surpri surprising. All right. Uh, is this Gaza? I just want to finish out. Finish it. Go ahead. Finish, and then I'll come to you next, Ryan. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I have two questions on that. Uh, the first question. You said to emphasize that there will not be a ceasefire and release of Like combat or uh, any military troops on the ground. But do you will have uh, military advisors and uh, intelligence uh, advisor on border of Gaza? I, I, I would defer to the Pentagon to speak about in detail about military. Okay, the second, the second question on, uh, on Palestine and the resolutions. Uh, like, last question for me, like 10 days ago, you told me like there are, there are <coughs> many Arab countries recognized Israel, uh, even the border issue. Israel doesn't have a border. So why USA doesn't like take an uh, initiative and recognize Palestine regardless this uh, border issue and like recognize it as a state and that maybe uh, like help people feel that there is a hope that they will have a, a country where there is like one state solution, sure. two state solution. It is, it, like, like as, as Arab, yeah, Arab yeah. countries recognize Israel without borders, because why you don't recognize Palestine without borders? Because it has been the long standing position uh, of the United States that recognition of a Palestinian state is something that should be negotiated between the, the relevant parties. Ryan, go ahead. So with Netanyahu canceling this delegation and promising to go into Rafa anyway, is, is the U.S. taking any precautions to make sure that U.S. weapons are not going to be used in that invasion that he's promising? So. Let me answer that in two ways. Number one, to say, which is it has always been our expectation that uh, United States weapons be used in full compliance with international humanitarian law. I know that's a different question than what you asked, but I think it's, it's uh, important to put on the record. With respect to um, what may happen in an ultimate invasion of Rafa, um, I, I said this a little bit in response to Humera's uh, uh, question. I really don't want to get ahead of the facts. Um, we do still expect to have 
discussions about this matter with the government of Israel. We believe there is a better way to do it. And um, beyond that, I don't want to speculate about what may happen and, down the road. And re real quickly, I don't know if you've seen this report, but uh, Shin Beit has sort of threatened an American citizen uh, who posted, I think, on social media about the location of Netanyahu's son. Uh, is, is that okay? Yeah, so I've seen the reports. I uh, we've not talked to the individual in question. I don't. Uh, we don't have the ability, or have not as of yet, uh, verified on behalf of the United States government the underlying allegations. But I would say that as a general matter, the United States would oppose any effort by any foreign government attempting to intimidate any individuals in the United States uh, from engaging in protected free speech activities. Uh, all right. Wrap up, guys. What do you want? All right, let's move. On. We'll, all right, go ahead. Go ahead. We'll we'll move on. On Mexico, President Lopez Obrador was interviewed over the weekend and explained some hesitancy to go after cartels at the request or at the behest of foreign governments. He called it part of his Mexico First policy. Wanted to see if you had any response to that, and then separately, a little more specific. There's some investigative reporting over the weekend that drug cartels are targeting seniors, Americans and Canadians, with timeshares and uh, extorting them to sell or pressuring them to sell and then extorting them with upfront fees. Um, I wanted to see if you were aware of that issue, if you had any comment outside of the standard travel advisory. So I don't have any comment on the, on the second. I have seen those reports, but I just don't have a comment. Uh, with respect to the, the first, I'm not aware what the specific uh, comment refers to, but the United States has been made very clear that we want to work with the Mexican government to stop cartels from smuggling dangerous drugs in the United States, and we've had long, a long-standing productive partnership with the government of Mexico to uh, accomplish just that. You've seen the Secretary travel to Mexico a number of times to further our work together to try and uh, take on the cartels that are trafficking fentanyl and other drugs that do so much harm to uh, the American public. Thank you, Matt. On uh, Russia, North Korea, and uh, Ukraine, North Korea uh, announced that uh, it expected Russia to recognize it as a nuclear state. And Russia's Kremlin said that the escalation of tensions on the Korean Peninsula was due to United States deterrence power. He also said that the Russia would guarantee a nuclear umbrella to North Korea. So if Russia alone guarantees North Korea's nuclear weapons, do you think North Korea will be recognized as a nuclear state? So I, I will say what we have said before, but as we are committed to the complete and total denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, and of course, uh, we continue to remain concerned about the growing and burgeoning partnership between uh, uh, the Russian government and uh, North Korea. In Ukraine, uh, Russia used a large number of North Korean ballistic missiles against Ukraine. Uh, however, uh, Ukraine government announced that uh, defective North Korean-made weapons. How does the U.S. assess North Korean's weapons? Do, do you have any components to this? I don't have any particular assessment to offer from here. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you, Matthew, if I come back. A couple mm -hmm. of questions on Russia and Ukraine. Uh, staying on, uh, on Moscow first and uh, Friday attack. Um, you know, Kremlin uh, continues to try to pin the blame on Ukraine without any evidence, and Putin's ambassador to Washington uh, has denied uh, the fact that the U.S. has uh, tipped off um, prior to the uh, you know, prior to the, the, the attack. Can you just walk us through that, some of I'm the... I'm sorry, what was the, with the, the, the... There was a tip-off from the U.S. You know, he denied that there was any tip-off hmm. from, from Washington. Can you just walk us through some of your communications with the Russians in, in the run-up to, you know, last Friday? And what do you know? When did you know it? And how did you communicate? <laughs> so, uh, two things. With respect to the first question, there was no... Ukrainian involvement, period. You've seen the Ukrainian government make that clear. And of course, uh, with respect to these statements, the Russians have offered zero evidence because there is no evidence uh, of Ukrainian uh, involvement. With respect to the warnings that we provided to the government of Russia, um, yes, we did uh, offer warnings to the government of Russia in early March about um, a planned terrorist attack in Moscow, specifically potentially targeting large gatherings, including co uh, concerts. We gave them that 
private warning consistent with our duty to warn that we have when we see uh, or when we gather intelligence of terrorist attacks or potential terrorist attacks. You might uh, re recall that uh, several months ago we warned the government of Iran about a potential terrorist attack by ISIS-K in Iran, one that ultimately uh, quite tragically also came to be true. Um, and it was because of that warning that we passed on to the Russian government that we issued a security warning on March 7, where we again um, uh, said to U.S. citizens that we had information about a planned terrorist attack in Moscow, potentially including uh, potentially targeting large gatherings, uh, including concerts. Was it communicated through diplomatic channels? Uh, uh, the I'm not going to speak to uh, the specific channels through which we. Can. As you know, France today raised its uh, threat, uh, you know, security level uh, to the highest. Is there any concern on your end that U.S. interests, U.S. companies, diplomats might be under increasing danger abroad in Europe? In this case, look, we always encourage United States companies uh, operating overseas to be vigilant to threats in their area, and we issue security alerts uh, uh, in various countries uh, around the world. Um, but I don't have any updates to offer today. And back to Ukraine, heavy bombardments we have seen during the past five days in a row. What is your reading of uh, Putin's motivation? At this very moment, uh, is it be, yeah, maybe because he is, you know, uh, encouraged by the fact that you know Ukraine is has a shortage of air defense? Uh, as look, uh, I think uh, Vladimir Putin's motives have has, have not changed. He wants to conquer Ukraine and subjugate the Ukrainian people. He's made very clear that his motivations haven't changed, and you've seen him publicly reference just in the past. Uh, 10 days or so that he has no interest in negotiating with Ukraine right now because he's seen the ammunitions uh, shortages that they are suffering. So from the perspective of this administration, it only highlights the need for the, the United States Congress to pass the president's supplemental funding request and provide Ukraine with the weapons it needs to defend itself against Russia's aggression. I got one more right, let, me, let me go. That's three, Alex, and we've been we've gone around a lot. So. Please come back to me. If you, if you uh, I'm, not, I'm not making any promises. <laughs> so, go ahead. The government says that uh, for the third time already, um, a Russian cruise missile flew, flew through um, the Polish airspace. And um, the Russian ambassador was called in, and he just refused to show up. Um, do you have to? Do you have any response to that? And did you have any contacts with the Polish authorities regarding that incident? We have been in close communication with the Polish authorities about this matter, and we have said to them the the. Uh, privately, what I will reiterate publicly from this podium, which is our commitment to NATO and the security of our NATO allies, which of course includes Poland, is ironclad and it will not waver. So uh, would uh, Poland be within its right to, uh, you know, strike it down next time? Uh, I'm just not going to speak on behalf of decisions made by uh, a foreign country. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Uh, in 30 days, the Iraqi Prime Minister will be here in Washington, D.C. And the Iraqi Prime Minister will be here in Iraqi what the Iraqi official says that they are saying that we are in negotiation with the U.S. government and in post U.S. coalition forces to defeat ISIS relations with the U.S. Is there any discussion with the Iraqi government about the post U.S. led coalition forces in Iraq? Uh, I don't want to get into our private conversations. We do have the meeting with the foreign minister come up and uh, coming up, and we'll have a readout of that meeting uh, after afterwards. And have you got any understanding with the Iraqi government, especially about the HMC meetings, but about the future and the evolution of your forces in Iraq? I just don't have any announcements with respect to meetings, Mayor. <coughs> Talked about relationship with Poland, right? Yeah. Um, you call it ironclad. So, how would you characterize the relationship with Israel right now? Is that ironclad as well? We have a close. Uh, we have a close relationship with the government of Israel. They are uh, a major non-NATO ally of ours. Uh, it's why you've seen us in such close communication sure. with them. Secretary has been to Israel seven times now since October 7th. Uh, there are things with, uh, there are broad areas on which we agree. The defeat of Hamas is uh, one of them. Uh, a commitment to Israel security is another. And then there are, of course, areas where we have disagreements. Do you think there was any negative impact um, after, you know, the, the disagreements have been piling up, but today we saw uh, Israel threatening to do something if U.S policy wouldn't change or if U.S. wouldn't act in a certain way that it wants. And U.S. didn't act that way and they followed through on their threat. And right now, a uh, conversation that Washington uh, thought was important uh, is not happening. You know, how would you 
is there any lasting impact on this? Or how would you characterize the relationship right now based on that? So I will leave it to professional pundits uh, to make those types of characterizations. I will just, ta I will just talk about... I'm not seeking you know, professional pundits' I, opinion. I, I, I'm I understand. Seeking... I will just talk about the facts of our relationship, which is we have very direct, candid discussions. I was sitting in the meeting between the secretary and the prime minister in the war cabinet uh, on Friday, and I can tell you those conversations are at times quite direct. Uh, on areas where we have disagreement and that disagreements, and that has been the case, um, not just back to October seventh, but since before October seventh. And it is, I'll just say, it is partly because of our long-standing relationship with Israel. It's a relationship that um, is not just between this administration and the Israeli government. It is a relationship that goes back between multiple governments and administrations on both in the United States and Israel. It's a relationship between the American people and the Israeli people, and so. It is because we have that kind of long-standing relationship that we can be pretty frank with each other. Right. Um, we don't make threats to them. We don't expect them to make threats to us. We have direct, honest uh, conversations about areas where we disagree, uh, and of course, honest conversations when we agree. Right. You said you'd expect to present the alternatives for Rafa at some point. Um, I mean, are you? Is the U.S. determined to present them no matter what? I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is. Do you think Israel is uh, genuinely willing to hear them out? Or did you get any sense from them that this week was a bit of an exercise and the UN resolution saga gave them an out uh, so out of this? I'm not going to speak for um, what the government of Israel intends or what they, uh, but, but, but I will say that when we met with them in Israel uh, on Friday, they made clear that they did want to see um, the options, the alternatives that the United States was going to present. We think it's important to uh, that they see those options because we do believe that the path that they are currently on uh, towards a full-scale invasion of Rafa is one that would weaken Israel's security and hurt the Palestinian people, uh, cause uh, inordinate human, human suffering that doesn't need to happen. So um, we will continue to have conversations with them about And this. after today, it's still your understanding that they're still willing to hear out those alternatives. Uh, I, this is something that just broke in the last few hours, so uh, I'm not going to speak to what future conversations that we are going to have with them. But we talk to the government of Israel every day at different levels. The secretary has conversations with um, uh, officials in the Israeli government. Our ambassador is in and out of the Israeli government all the time, uh, talking about um, things that they want from us and uh, oftentimes presenting things that we want them to do. And I do expect that those conversations will continue on multiple levels, levels between our government and theirs about multiple topics, including a potential invasion of Rafa. Sean. Um, completely different topic. Um, Senegal. Uh, the uh, the election results um, after you know quite a bit of, of controversy on it uh, the uh, the the outgoing president President Saul has congratulated the opposition candidate uh, Mr. Fay on this. Do you have a reaction? Is it a happy ending? Is it democracy? Uh so we congratulate the people of Senegal on their enthusiastic participation in yesterday's well-run election. We look forward to congratulating Senegal's new president once the results are official. And we note that both domestic and international observers have characterized election day as predominantly peaceful, and that election officials, polling staff, party agents, and security forces were generally professional. The commitment of the Senegalese people to the democratic process is part of the foundation of our deep friendship and strong bilateral ties. So yes, when you... Um, uh, uh, Ask the, the question about are we pleased with how this has proceeded? Look, you had a um, uh, uh, several months ago, a month ago, six weeks, and I don't remember the exact timing, uh, potential suspension of elections. We made very clear that we wanted to see elections take place as soon as possible. And you saw uh, ultimately the courts in Senegal make that clear, and we're pleased that um, those elections have proceeded. Nick, I call on you with some trepidation. Whenever someone leaves the room and then comes back to ask a question, uh, I get I get wor I get worried what's coming at me. But go, but go ahead. Um, I hope I don't regret this. this is on Afghanistan, and it's a little old. There's a SIGAR report that said of the 2.9 billion that the UN has provided to Afghanistan since the U.S. withdrawal there, uh, some of that, including uh, U.S. taxpayer money, has gone into Taliban-controlled banks. Are you familiar with that report? I have and you go ahead. What's being done to prevent stuff like that from happening? So let me take that question and get back to you. I've seen the report. Okay. Um, uh, I'm sure there's more we have to say about it, but let me just take it back and get you a, com get you a complete answer. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, so attack. Uh, does the United States have any plans to boost security cooperation with Moscow? 
Uh, <laughs> no, obviously, I think. Um, so when it comes to the attack, a few things. Number one, you saw the secretary in a statement that he issued on Saturday express his deep condolences on behalf of the United States to the loss of life and the suffering by the Russian people. Number two, when we have, if we have intelligence in the future, like the intelligence we had with respect to this attack, we will of course make it available to the Russian government because we don't want to see terrorist attacks be successful anywhere in the world. We don't want to see the Russian people suffer. Uh, we have never had any quarrel with the Russian, the Russian people. So we will of course provide, um, if we have intelligence information about potential attacks, we will provide that information to the Russian government just as we provide it to the government of Iran, a country with which we have deep lasting disagreements because we don't want to see the people of Iran suffer. And just like as our quarrel is not with the Russian people, our quarrel is not with the Iranian people. Hold on. I'm still answering a, a, another question. Um, but that said, obviously, we are not going to boost our security uh, uh, or boost any security agreements or start any security agreements with the government of Russia, a government that we have seen uh, uh, invade one of its neighbors uh, unprovoked. Um, kill thousands and thousands of people for no reason at all except for to pursue the personal um, uh, conquest objectives of the Russian president. So no, we will not be taking that step. One more? Yeah, one more. One more. As you probably know, Vladimir Zelensky presidential term expires on May 20th and there, there is no election on the horizon. Will Zelensky still be the legitimate president of Ukraine for you past May 20th? So ultimately, these are questions for the Ukrainian people to decide. We want to see presidential elections uh, and all elections in Ukraine, but we recognize that it's a difficult thing to conduct in the middle of the war. This isn't a question that's unique to Ukraine. It's a question to, uh, that um, pertains to any country that has um, uh, in the middle of a war, especially when you don't just have the question of soldiers on the front lines being able to vote. You have the question of how you deal with these occupied territories where the Russian uh, military is occupying um, Ukrainian land uh, and would prevent Ukrainian citizens from making their voices heard in the, in the election. So it's a very difficult issue to work through, and ultimately it's a decision for the Ukrainian uh, people to make. Go ahead. No. Thank you. Thank you. There is a fear uh, among Palestinians that the new land, the seaport, will be built by U.S. Army, will be used as a U.S. military base, and also will be used to displace Palestinians from Gaza to other countries, and also indicate that, uh, uh, that uh, Rafah will be attacked because, you know, the, the aid, it's much easier to, uh, to bring it through the Egyptian borders not uh, from the port. So uh, two things. One, with respect to the pier that the U.S. military is uh, constructing, it is for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to facilitate the delivery of humanitarian assistance. Uh, it is not to displace the Palestinian people. It is not to facilitate the arrival of U.S. troops uh, in Gaza. The president has made clear that there will not be U.S. troops deployed to Gaza. It is just to um, uh, deliver much needed humanitarian assistance. The second point I would make is what you've heard from the president to the secretary on down to uh, little old me, and that is that the, uh, that the provision of humanitarian assistance through that port is the same as the provision of humanitarian assistance that we're providing uh, through airdrops. It is meant to supplement not replace the delivery of humanitarian assistance through Rafa, but also through Karim Shalom and through the 96th gate that uh, Israel has uh, recently opened to provide humanitarian assistance directly to the north. Those cannot be turned off. They have to be uh, not just kept open, but they have to be increased and sustained. So uh, because ultimately that is the best way to deliver humanitarian assistance, but the op other options we're pursuing are to supplement that assistance. And also not to take the gas in Gaza. Uh, uh, and not to what? The gas in Gaza, in the Sea of Gaza. Uh, I'm not sure what, to what yes. you're... The gas. The gas, okay. yes. No, the no, gas. of course, it has nothing, it has nothing, to, nothing to do with that. Okay, uh, the other question, please. Uh, is it logic to cut off the fund uh, for the UNRWA, regarding to UNRWA, uh, even if there is 12 uh, employees, uh, they are uh, cooperate with, uh, with Hamas in uh, October 7th, uh, there is more than 30,000 served uh, employees mm. in uh, UNRWA. So uh, is it logic to cut off uh, the fund because this reason? So Unless there is another reason to <coughs> get rid of uh, UNRWA and uh, to release or to get rid of uh, the refugees uh, 
uh, issues? So uh, we have made clear that we support the work that UNRWA does. We paused our funding because of the uh, very serious allegations uh, that UNRWA found credible. It's not just that Israel found them credible, it's that UNRWA did. Um, but as it pertains, I think you're probably referring to the action that the United States Congress took. We ultimately will follow the law because that's our duty to do so. All right, we'll take one more up front and then we'll wrap for today. Thanks, Matt. Can you give an update on the number of uh, evacuees from Haiti and on uh, the helicopter lifts and whether you anticipate any more charter flights to be going from Cap Haitian? Sure. Those? So we have three flights, uh, helicopter flights, uh, leaving today. We have four that are planned for tomorrow. Um, we have facilitated the safe departure of over 340 U.S. citizens out of Haiti since March 17th. That includes approximately 250 uh, U.S. citizens who have departed Port-au-Prince. Um, and another 100 that have de departed uh, through Cap, Cap Haitian. Uh, we continue to pursue, to, to explore uh, other alternatives to evacuate uh, American citizens from Haiti, but I don't have anything further to announce today. With that, we'll wrap. Thanks, everyone.